figurative form of speech, I reckon. Although I, I, I just realized when I was growing up as a Christian, right, um, in, in my church back in the Philippines, I was, yeah, we were taught that when you go to heaven, then you will receive many crowns. Depends on how you perform um, in this life, you know. Um, and, and the pastor would always say, aspire for as many crowns as you want, you know, like in the afterlife. But I reckon the many crowns in the song that we sang is about attributing praise and worship and glory uh, to our God. We, we give Him praise because of, right? And that's what worship is about. We respond to God in praise for all the things that He has done. It's not like you picture God. Of course, God is spirit, right? With me? God is spirit. Um, but don't try to envision a deity or a god with so many crowns on their head. It doesn't really work like that. It's more of giving God all the praise, okay? And every Sunday, you, you're actually singing the song, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Not literally, but as you praise God in your heart for all the things that He has done for you, you are giving Him a crown. He doesn't need a crown, you know, because our God is an everlasting God. But as creatures, as people whom he has created, we ought to respond to God in praise. Amen? Amen. It's the same way you give um, a compliment to someone. You know, like, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this for me. Um, Again, it gives us joy to praise. It gives us joy um, to be grateful. It gives us joy to, to give thanks to the people around us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, it is a blessing to see a brother or sister in Christ it, within our midst. And can you, before you, you all fall asleep right now, I haven't started preaching, can you just look to the person to your left and to your right and give them a smile and say, you know what, I'm blessed to see you here. There you go. <laughs> yes? <laughs> I reckon church will be more enjoyable if we actually see each other. Do you believe that? Church becomes such a joy if we actually see eye to eye, if we actually make eye contact. Okay, I'm so into this uh, wellness, well-being thingy, and I I cannot really stop in in sharing this to you. During the time that I'm recovering from um, from surgery, I enrolled in a the Science of Well-Being course from Yale University in the United States, right? So last week, we started this talk about being grateful and being in the moment. Now, I just want to share this to you before we dig into the patriarchs. Anyway, the the preaching is short. It's about Isaac. And Isaac is basically just an appendage um, in the patriarchs. So, um, yeah. Um, Apparently, okay, they did some experiment, and this is not related to the preaching. They did some experiment in a museum, where they ask people, you know, like they planted people in the museum, right? Um, He said, like, um, when you're like five feet away from someone, okay, you smile. And then when you're 10 feet away from someone, you just try to make eye contact, okay? So they they did that, then they planted people there. And then afterwards, they, they made a survey of the experience of the people in the museum, you know, of how did they appreciate the art. Of course, the art in itself is something that could make people happy. It should invoke a response. But apparently, the feedback of the people is that, whoa, the museum is such a happy place. Right, the museum, pe- the, the people there are so, so, so and they, they didn't even talk. They just made eye contact and they smiled. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that every Sunday will be a worthwhile Sunday for you if you just make eye contact and smile um, to people. And maybe you can start doing that here. Make Central a happy place, right? A happy place. So the feedback that we'll get from visitors is that, you know what? They just don't like shake their hands during this funky song, right? But they actually cared because they see, they see me, right? Maybe you can start doing that, you know? That, that's, that's really good. Okay, for those of you who have, um, or just... It just came in um, this week. We're doing a series called In the Name of the Fathers. It's following the discipleship journeys of the patriarchs in Genesis. A lot of times when we talk about big Christian terms, discipleship, or a life of following God, we make references from the New Testament. But last week I made the proposition that maybe, you know, like by just using the life 
of these uh, mighty men of God in the Old Testament whom God called actually to fulfill his purpose, maybe we can glean from their life experience in terms of discipleship. So it's not just a monopoly of the New Testament people um, for us to, to learn from in terms of following God, but we could learn from, from these guys. And actually, this is a life process. And, and you realize that from last week. Did you enjoy last week's preaching on Abraham? For those of you who were here? Can I have a show of hands of those of you who were here, right? So did you enjoy the scandals in the life of Abraham? You know, that Abraham is actually a liar, a cheater, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and he has a, like, yeah, he, he had a child out, out of wedlock, you know, out of uh, all of those stuff. But we realize that Abraham, as a man being called by God, actually followed God and persevered up to the very end. And so we could learn a lot from, from him. Can we have the next slide? So this is it. Um, that, that's the life of um, Abraham, really. Last week, we learned how the father of faith led a very colorful life under God. And having discovered loads of discipleship principles in his life, I just feel that, you know, like you shouldn't feel so bad about yourself, especially when you don't measure up to what is expected of you as a follower of Jesus Christ. Because you know what? The people whom God has called, even in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament itself, they, act, they actually failed miserably. But the key to their success in following God is what? Is perseverance. The secret to, you know, if there is such a thing as a formula for success in being a Christian, is what? It's just continuing on. It's just continuing on. There's no secret recipe for, oh, you're so good. You're so, such a good Christian. The key is just press on. Because you know what? Every step of the way in this life, you will encounter problems. You know, just, just being here right now, probably there are people here you don't like. <laughs> you know, and you feel like, oh, I, don't, I shouldn't be here. And then when you come out of the street, you know, like you, you think about your domestic problems, there are stuff that is going on in your life that you probably wouldn't want. Um, there are challenges. But the key is don't stop, right? Don't stop being a Christian. Don't stop journeying to follow God. Because once you stop, that's it, right? We are all called to be followers of God but you cease to become a follower of God if you stop, right? So what's our encouragement for the people that we have here right now, the people beside you, is don't stop. Can you say that to your seatmate right now? It's like, brother, sister, please don't stop, <laughs> right? <laughs> please don't stop. <laughs> okay, then we can conclude this message now. We can pray. <laughs> I think that's, the, that's how it is. Now this morning... We shall be studying. We shall be focusing on the life of the son. Okay, so we have Abraham, and he has a son. Father Abraham had one son. No, he has many sons. The legit son, right? The son which fails in comparison to the life of his father. Isaac. Okay, is Isaac here? There you go. <laughs> Isaac is a common name, right? I mean, a lot of... A lot, no, it's not. <laughs> is it not? You know, I thought like um, for a while, you know, I've, I've met a lot of Isaacs um, uh, in my life. Sometimes we just get random names from the Bible, right? And they say, okay, this is a nice name. But if you will compare Isaac and rank him in terms of significance from among the four pa patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, he's probably number four. Okay, so <laughs> why? Why do I say that? Because Isaac is considered as a very passive very passive character in the Old Testament patriarchs' narratives. Patriarchs mean fathers, okay, fathers. Um, in the life of, uh, if, okay, if the life of Abraham is like a tabloid, right? That's how we compare it last time. So scandalous, worthy of being a tabloid uh, kind of a personality. Um, Isaac could probably be compared to a doll paperback, okay? A doll paperback or a reference book that's gathering dust in your bookshelves. This is because he's almost like an appendage um, to the patriarch narratives, okay? Some Bible commentators would place his narrative as a gap or like as an interlude or, or like as a pulse. Do you get that? And would you like your life to be like that, okay? If, you're, if we're telling your life story... Would you, like, would you like your life story to be like in your family tree? You're like a footnote <laughs> in your family tree. 
But that's how it is. A short pause, an intermission number leading to a more dynamic Jacob and Joseph narratives. Okay, so just remember that. This is like just, just fun fact um, to, to memorize. So if last week I showed you tabloids, this week we're going to show you books, right? On the, on the life of um, Isaac. So why do we say that he's just an appendage? Okay, number one, Isaac appears in Genesis chapter 21 as the promised child to Abraham. Focus of the story, is it Isaac? No. It's Abraham and God's promise to him and the promise for him to have a child which will become many nations, right? In chapter 22 of Genesis, we talk about the sacrifice. Yes, Isaac is the one that's being sacrificed, but the story's focus is not on Isaac, but is still in the faith of Abraham. And that was what's read um, in the Hebrews passage by Sharon. Abraham thought that If Isaac is actually sacrificed and he was willing to sacrifice his son, God will raise him up from the dead. But God didn't allow his son to be sacrificed um, and provided another ram uh, as a form of sacrifice. So the Genesis 22 passage about him is not really about him. It's still about his father. Now, Genesis 24 um, talks about Isaac as well. But the focus is not really him. It's a focus on the father's servant looking for his wife, okay? So the focus is, the highlight is on the faithfulness of Abraham's servant and the course, of course, focus on Isaac's wife. And his name is? Huh? (laughs) She's part of our congregation, right? (laughs) What's the name of Isaac's wife? Back. <laughs> Rebecca, right? With the with the K, right? Rebecca with the K. Right. So so that's that's how it is. So it's never about Isaac as well. Okay? And then in Genesis twenty five, um, Isaac should have been given as much highlight because we're talking about okay, the sons of Abraham. He's the legit heir, mind you, he's the one. However, part of the limelight was shared with uh, the illegitimate child named Ishmael. Um, and so therefore, he had to share that with his half-brother. And then, as Genesis 25 continues, the narrative about the twins begins. So Isaac had twins, namely Jacob and Esau, and their struggle begins in that chapter. So it's almost like, okay, we just need, need to mention you, but let's proceed now with the next um, narrative. So it's a bit sad for this Bible character because he only has one chapter that's devoted solely to him. And this is Genesis 26, which we will give him the benefit of scouring through. Of course, I cut out some of the, uh, some of the passage still because I feel like we don't have enough time for him. But anyway, we'll, we're giving um, Isaac what is his due. Um, in Genesis 26, we're, we'll discuss about Isaac shadowing for God. And if I would have a book, I will title it like a closer look at the most underrated biblical patriarch based on um, Genesis chapter 28. So with an open heart and an open mind, let us learn from the discipleship journey of this guy that's probably insignificant compared to the other characters in the Bible, but nonetheless, we can learn a lot from. Can, can I just invite you guys to just pause for a while and let us uh, pray to the Lord? God, thank you so much for your word, and I just pray that um, even as we uh, meditate upon your word, that your your spirit will be um, in us and and will guide us um, as as we learn from you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, and everybody say, amen and amen. So let's go to Genesis chapter 28. There was famine in the land, and besides the previous famine in Abraham's time, Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. If you were listening to uh, my sermon last week, we mentioned of an Abimelech in Gerar as well. What happened there? For those of you who were here last week, Abimelech and then Gerar, and then that's Abraham and his wife. What happened there? Sarah. You remember? 
wow that was like just last week but anyway let's let's proceed so the lord appeared to isaac and said do not go down to egypt live in the land where i tell you to live stay in this land for a while and i will be with you and bless you for you and your descendants and i will give all these lands and i will confirm the oath i swore to your father um abraham i will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky i will give them all these lands and through your offspring all the nations on earth will be blessed let's read verse five one two three go because abraham obeyed me and did everything i required of him keeping my commands my decrees and my instruction so this is like the first one-to-one -one encounter of um, isaac with god and god is speaking to him and god is giving him some big promises but it's not out of his merit, though. It's because of his father. It's because of the obedience of his father. That's why I, I entitled my, my message as shadowing, because it's almost like a shadow kind of thing. Have you felt this way in your life? You're a shadow of your sibling, or you're a shadow of your parents, or like very good Christians. Actually, as I was meditating upon this, for those of you who are second generation Christians, please take note of the life of Isaac because it's almost like that. A lot of you are here because your parents pushed you to be here, right? A lot of you have become Christians because someone someone just, just asked you to be there, you know? And somehow you feel like, well, you know what? Okay, I I'm gonna do it. But you're not really there because you feel like it's not really out of your own merits that you um that, that you have the faith. So this is what the Lord said. And because of that, um, he obeyed. Right? Isaac stayed in Gerar. Now, brothers and sisters, Isaac's discipleship journey was very much directed by God's promises to his father. Okay? Have you met someone talking to you, not about you, but about someone else, but you're accepted simply because of the endorsement given by someone? It's not really about you. And that's, that's how I feel about you know where where isaac is almost like he didn't have much room to follow his own path it's a second-hand generation of faith that i reckon I, I said some of you share my parents are christians and ergo i should be a christian as well and i really couldn't measure up with them you know what my dad um, is a missionary and people are forcing me to be missionary as well my dad is a pastor and so therefore i should be a pastor it doesn't really work like that but some of you are tied to that Okay, my, my dad is a deacon. My dad is like serving in the church. My mother faithfully serves in Sunday school, and so therefore I should be. The pressure is, is, is not easy, um, especially for those who have faithful parents, those who are tied together to the faith because of a spouse. Okay, so it's not just parental faith. Um, you become a Christian because your spouse is a Christian, and so therefore you're pressured um, to be one, right? You become a Christian because a best friend is a Christian, and so therefore you need to follow through. It's never your own, but somehow you just feel like, hey, I'll just give it a go, right? With me, following through. If you're in that situation, then this is the time for you to listen, because you know what? There is a purpose why <laughs> you, you find yourselves um, in, that, in that position, right? Those relationships had somehow brought you to a discipleship pathway, and your only option is to keep those ties. And therefore... We said, Isaac, okay, God talked to Isaac, and then he, he obeyed nonetheless. And God put, um, you know, asked him to stay put and, and commanded him. So faith, in a way, is accepted. It is received. But is it a deep kind of faith? Is it a faith that will grow? We don't know. But somehow, by default, you find yourself in that kind of a situation. Are you with me? Right? I'm, I'm talking especially to the young kids here. You are here by default, whether you like it or not, because you don't have a choice. You're under the parental authority, right? And so therefore, you know, God said, please be there because your parents are there anyway. You know, but that's, that's how it is. Yep. The next one. Let's continue on. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, so they moved to Gerar. Uh, they stayed in Gerar. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said... She's my sister because he was afraid to say she is my wife. He thought the men of his place might kill me on the account of Rebecca because she is beautiful. Sounds family. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Huh? Remember I asked you Abimelech? You know? And Gerar? 
and it's almost the same, right? So that's, that's, that's how it is. Now, when Isaac has been there for a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from the window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, PG, okay, PG-13. Um, so Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Isaac answered him. Can we read that? I cannot read the red one from here. Okay, can we read the red, uh, the red highlighted uh, word? One, two, three. Because I thought I might lose my life on the account of her. Hmm. Wow. This is so last week, right? So last season. Um, is this the same Abimelech guy that Abraham deceived in his narrative? Just recall, last week we talked about Abraham and his encounter with, Ger uh, you know, like Abimelech of Gerar. And he said, okay, you know, like um, they found Sarah, who's like probably really, really old then, pretty still. And then, you know, like they, they, he did the deception. Is he the one? Now, according to biblical scholars, he could be the son. There's an Abimelech too, right? Or they say it could be a general term for a king. A king is known as an Abimelech. Yeah, but it's in the story. So we just need to take the story at face value. Now the point is not whatever, whoever that Abimelech is, is whatever happened um, during that time. So what did Abimelech say? Abimelech said that this is what you, what is this that, that you have done to us? One of the men might have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, anyone who harms this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So there's a little bit of a twist in the story because in the previous one, Abraham was just trying to preserve his life, right? For this one, he was given a reprieve. However, there was a clause. Okay, you can stay here. And now I put a law that, okay, anyone who touches this couple will be put to death. Now, how do we make a reflection on this, brothers and sisters, right? Is it self-inflicted kind of an act uh, for Isaac? Was it genetics? Is it because he inherited the lying nature and the deceitful nature of his father? Or is this part of God's plan, right? This is a question of practicality, survival versus faith, right? Even though Abraham was the father of faith, you know, the survival necessity ruled during that time and i reckon it's the same thing now the difference here is that remember what is the role of this guy isaac now in the narrative so you have abraham isaac and then the rest of the the children he's the promised seed right so bible commentators would say that well it is necessary for him to be protected so that the lineage will continue that's how they see it i don't see it but can be possible, you know? Um, so, so that's how it is. So there was a protection clause um, given to him. Now, what happens now? So he's still in the shadows. He's not original in his failure. <laughs> you know, he's still following under the shadow of Abraham, but in, in the shadow of uncertainty, faith is compromised. And this is what I would like to tell you last week. You may say that you're the best Christian ever, but somehow your tendency to fail will always be there. But no matter how much you fail, don't give up. Continue. Why? Because God is in control. And even this one, if we follow this narrative, yeah, he may have failed, he may have cheated, but then it's for his own good. It's for his own protection, right? Because the lineage may, may continue. Still with me? Right? Yes, brothers and sisters? Anyone here who hasn't really failed in their faith, Kindly raise your hand. Because I will worship you if you haven't. <laughs> right? No one. No one. We're all flawed, but we have been redeemed. But we're not perfect. We're in the process of being perfected. So, what's the lesson here? If you fail, ask the Lord for forgiveness, first and foremost. And then just move on. Right, brothers and sisters? We're not asking for perfection here. So this is not the church of the perfect. Yeah, it would be nice, right, if you have a church of the perfect. <laughs> You're like at the door of your church. Church of the perfect, you know. <laughs> you have to be squeaky clean to come in. 
doesn't work like that because we're all um, sinners redeemed by the grace of God. Okay? Next slide, please. So we're almost there. Now, Isaac planted crops. So, this is, so they stayed in the place and they settled there. Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because what was happening in his life right now. Okay? So he accepted the faith. We, we're not really sure it's le legit or what. He's just there. And then the faith is tested, but yeah, massive fail. But he's just continuing on uh, because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. Right? So is God there with Isaac? even though he may not be, like, such a strong person? I'm not saying that prosperity is the measure of Christian maturity. No. But what I'm trying to say here is that even in that weak position, God is still blessing him. Right? God is still sustaining him. So he had so many flocks and herds and servants, so that the Philistines envied him, and all the wells that his father's servants had dug in this time uh, of his father, the Philistines stopped it filling them with earth, which is like, what, what are you doing? You know, like, um, that's how it is. Um, finally, there's a bit of conflict in the story, right? Very flat, very flat narrative here. Okay, there's a bit of slip up, and now there's a bit of conflict here. It's called water wars, right? They're just fighting for water, and, and, and that's how it is. Um, and then... Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and, and encamped in the valley of Gerar where he settled. He moved on from there and dug another well. Just keeps on digging well. One quarreled over it and he named it Rehoboth saying, can we say that together? Now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. Right? So that was really powerful because you know what? Isaac now is not under anyone's shadows. Isaac now is very much under the shadow of the Almighty, right? So in a way, he's moving away from his past, and he's moving away from, okay, the merits of Abraham. God is blessing Isaac as he is. He is actually flourishing. So what discipleship principle can we get here? You know what, like if we're under the presence of God, we will experience genuine faith. Your faith is fully experienced if you're under the shadow of God. Yes? Young people, maybe the reason why you're not taking your faith seriously is you haven't really encountered God yet. But look at some of the blessings that you have right now. Right? You have your phone to play with during sermon. <laughs> and then you have your parents who sent you to good schools, right? And then you have a family. You don't need to worry about your next meal you're healthy i always tell my kids you know especially when they're acting badly i said you know what in the philippines children as young as five years old they carry rocks in the quarry <laughs> you know like that kind of thing <laughs> of course we never I, i've never experienced that but I, i've seen that you know like people going through the dumps and the rubbish bins and yeah kids you don't need a supernatural miraculous experience to appreciate god you just need to count your blessings. Yeah, that's it. Sometimes it's tough, right? Especially if your parents are like deacons and leaders and whatnot. And I'm like, but you know what? Just count your blessings and you will be able to experience your faith. And this is what, what's been happening to this guy, um, Isaac, really. Okay, we're almost done here. That, then, of course, as we continue his narrative, that night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Okay, so this is becoming more like, okay, I'm relating to you now. I bless you, and I will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. And how did Isaac respond? Can we read verse 25 together? Church, one, two, three, go. Isaac. And there he pitched his tent, and there was, his servants still digs well. <laughs> this is a water boy. Okay, water boy story. But what is the point of this in terms of his shadow journey, brothers and sisters? Now Isaac is fully out of the shadows and is now reaping the covenant of Abraham for himself, right? He's stepping out of the shadows and he's beginning to worship the Lord. Okay? Always remember that. 
when people from the Old Testament builds an altar, they're actually worshiping God. So you, you will never worship God if you don't have any relationship with Him. You can fake the singing. You can fake the joy. But it won't be a genuine worship because worship comes from the heart. Right? You can join a rally and you can just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do the rave kind of thing. But it's, it, 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 ain't, it ain't legit, you know? Because it has to be coming from your heart. So again, going back to the second generation Christians here, or those who are, have somehow become Christians just because you're tied to someone else, you need to let go of that and own the faith for yourself. I know it's very hard. I think especially for pastor's kids or... But you know what? Studies have shown, okay? Again, studies have shown. This is a Christian study now, not psychology. <laughs> studies have shown that children under the altar, okay? These are the PKs and the MKs. Will eventually become PKs and MKs themselves. Oh, it's scary, ain't right? <laughs> you know? Even though at certain points in time in their lives, they struggle with the fact that, oh, I'm a pastor's kid or I am a missionary kid, and they hate it, you know, all the time that they're growing up, but eventually at the time when their parents have really surrendered to God, it's like, you know what? Yeah, Lord, you know, they don't, I don't want to impose upon them my calling, but eventually, okay, I'm going to take note. Eventually, <laughs> eventually these PKs and MKs will serve the Lord as well. It's just amazing. You know, but in their growing up years, they hate it. It's like, I don't like, I don't like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're imposing your faith on me. You're like, rah, 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 rah. but in the end, they become pastors. They become missionaries as well. So, yeah. At the end of the day, you look at your parents as you are preaching in the pulpit, and your mother and father's there, and they're probably smiling at just like, I told you so. <laughs> right? <laughs> because you, you didn't expect that um, to happen. So regardless of how you, ca you came to faith, brothers and sisters, there will always be a turning point. There will be a time when you need to make a decision to respond to God's offer of love and friendship. And there is a time to own your faith. You will never be able to escape the calling of God. Really. You cannot run away from your call. If God calls you, then, then you have to do it. You have to do it. I remember, I mean, my parents are not pastors, right? It was my mother who wanted me to be a pastor. And the time when she brought up the idea, I said, like, really? I'm going to be a doctor, really? Seriously? You know, like, and I was really rude when I was growing up. She was the first convert in the family from being a Catholic. And, and she wanted me to be a pastor. And I, I struggled with her. I, yeah, I was really bad. I was really, really bad to my mom. Um, and then my first entry point in the ministry is through theater and performing arts kind of thing. My first performance was the week that she died, actually. So she never saw me serve, like, in front. But I knew that she was the one who prayed for me to serve God. And years later, so I became a missionary, and then I became a pastor myself. And I'm like, Wow. If only mom could see me now, you know, like she's probably there forming in the clouds. It's like, John, I'm your mother, you know. <laughs> well done. <laughs> no, that's, that's Lion King. <laughs> anyway, yeah, um, it's just sad that she didn't see me, you know, eventually become a pastor. But it was her who prayed for me diligently so that I could become one. So, yeah kids yeah we love you and we know that you're in a you know like in a space where you're like oh no no it ain't gonna happen but if god calls you there um it's gonna happen so as we conclude here meanwhile abimelech has come to him from gerar with a, a, a who's that his personal advisor and Phicol, the commander of his forces isaac asked him why have you come to me since you were hostile to me i mean it was like moving away from these guys or like piling dirt on, on his wells. And they answered, okay, can we just read this together? One, two, three, go. We saw clearly that the Lord was with you. And I'll just read the black one. So we said, there ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you that you will do us no harm just as we did not harm you, but always treated you well and sent you away peacefully. And now you are blessed 
by the Lord. Amazing. So Isaac really has moved on, and um, his faith now is lived out. Oops, sorry. His faith is lived out for God, you know? Oops, there. Now, let's now go to, let's now wrap this up. Discipleship is not a passive journey. Okay, following God is never passive. You cannot say, I'm a Christian, and then I can sit in the pew forever. Or you cannot say, okay, I'm a Christian, I have the label, and I can just wait for myself to die. That's not how it works. It's never passive. It's an active process. Yes, maybe some things are not happening in your life yet, but it is a lifelong journey. So please forgive us, pastors, for pounding on what discipleship is, but it is an active and dynamic process that everyone has to experience. My examples here are not like New Testament people. These are people who live their normal lives, digging wells, you know, like having flocks and stuff. But God is with them. I'm not asking you to leave your jobs and become pastors, no. But in your daily life, in your workplace, as you work in the restaurant, as you receive people, you know, like in the desk, in the front desk of the hostel, you know, as you study nursing, you know, and you fight with your group mates for your group work, you know, that kind of thing. God is very much in there, and He's actively working in your life. This is what discipleship is all about. And of course, we don't miss out on the purpose of why God has called you. For Isaac, he was called, you know, like to continue the line. And he did function, no matter how passive his life is. And I would just leave you with a quote again from Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer says, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. That's why I'm saying... If you say, I'm not a disciple, then you're not a believer, right? If you say, okay, I'm just contented about here, I'm not going to journey, then where is Jesus there? Right? You need to find Jesus somewhere, because if Jesus is in there, then you will need to grow. Okay? Remember that Sunday school story, read your Bible, pray every day that you grow, grow, grow. And it goes higher. Then you grow, grow, grow. Then you grow, grow, grow. You need to. Okay? This is, this is it. This is just real. It's a bit harsh for Bonhoeffer, but the guy died anyway for his faith. You know? And he was hanged when the Americans were already in Germany. They were liberating Germany, but it was just like in the nick of time. The evil Germans hang him anyway. You know, that's, that's what happens. It was meant to be. Right? But this is what he's... we sing this again, it's about building your life before God. Think of your discipleship journey and let God work in your day-to-day -day life as a Christian. Let us sing together.
Brothers and sisters, look at me first. You're not a fixture. Okay? You're not a painting on the wall. You're not.